The evolution of bipedalism may actually play a major role in pair bonding, as if evolutionarily man stood up and then fell in love. Over the years, anthropologists have wondered why, when the great apes habitually knuckle walk, did our ancestors develop upright bipedal locomotion? Why they did so is an unresolved debate. Some have argued that it freed the hands for tool use. Others have suggested that it allows one to see further than when crouched or knuckle walking. In 1981, anthropologist C. Owen Lovejoy proposed that this development was linked to monogamy and the aid that our male ancestors gave to our female ancestors. In what became known as the provisioning hypothesis, Lovejoy proposed that hominins form pair bonds to increase the food supply to infants, which compared to other primates were born relatively immature and dependent on parental aid. In order to bring provisions back to the female and their offspring, males went off to find food such as small reptiles, amphibians, nuts, fruit, and eggs, and this necessitated freeing up the hands. Hence, selection processes allowed us to develop full bipedalism, which the great apes can achieve for only very brief periods. Lovejoy suggests that since Australopithecus afarensis was known to walk upright, bipedalism, pair bonding, and provisioning are all inextricably linked in our early evolutionary history. While this model helps to explain a number of human features, it has been criticized on the grounds that fossil evidence suggests Australopithecus afarensis demonstrated a high degree of sexual dimorphism. Some authorities consider males to have been approximately twice the size of females. This level of sexual dimorphism is normally associated with polygynous mating systems in other primates, not species with a high degree of monogamous pair bonding. Monogamous pair bonded species tend to have little or no sexual dimorphism, meaning few major physiological differences between the males and females. Since the male individuals of monogamous species have no need to compete for harems, the way gorillas or savanna baboons do, there is little reason for them to grow much larger than the females. Lovejoy subsequently reanalyzed such fossils finding that levels of sexual dimorphism in the A. afarensis were actually quite similar to modern-day humans, supporting the notion of monogamy. This evolutionary drive to both seek and stay with a partner is rare in the animal kingdom. Only 3% of mammals do it. Why do we form pair bonds around the world? Men and women pair up to rear their young. And in fact, this is extremely uncommon among our uh, mammalian relatives. Fisher believes that the roots of love may be linked to the one thing that separates us from our primate cousins, standing on two feet. With the beginning of walking, women began to have to carry their babies in their arms instead of on their backs. And I don't see how a woman could have carried the equivalent of a 20-pound bowling ball in one arm and sticks and stones in the other arm and protected herself. So she began to knead and mate to help her rear her young. Pair bonding became essential to females and suitable to males, and we evolved this brain system for attachment, that brain system associated with human love. The provisioning hypothesis was further developed to integrate two previous ideas involving food supply and explanations of why humans diverge from other anthropoid apes, the man the hunter and the woman the gatherer hypotheses. The hunting hypothesis proposed that ecological pressures presented by hunting led men to develop complex tools, weapons, and communication in addition to bipedalism. In contrast, the gathering hypothesis suggests that the evolutionary pressures that led to these human developments came from the problems presented to women who went out to gather food and who benefited from the mutual exchange of vegetable items and being bipedal also allowed them to carry infants and babies. Of course, such hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, and there might be some truth in both. It is certainly the case that in today's foraging societies, hunting is largely a male preserve, and the gathering of plant foods is largely a female concern. But whether or not this is directly related to bipedalism remains an area of debate. Sexual selection may have acted to improve hunting prowess in men, perhaps by increasing upper body strength. It may also have improved the manufacture and use of weapons and tools in males, and might even have favored the formation of male coalitions in order to exploit large prey through cooperative hunting. 
if meat had become an important part of the human diet, however, might we not also expect women to have become good hunters? Up to a point, women may actually have been hunters. Women also have large brains, hands that can grip with precision, and good stereoscopic vision. It is not unheard of for women in modern forager societies to engage in hunting occasionally. Also, as we have seen, female bonobos are known to engage in hunting on occasions, so this is by no means male exclusive behavior for primates. But the problem for women as hunters is that control over the reproductive cycle is a recent human invention. For our female ancestors, certainly as judged by the role in the majority of present-day forager societies, hunting was a less likely option since for most of their typically short adult lives they would either be lactating or pregnant. Of course, being pregnant or nursing a baby would not be a great encumbrance when gathering plant food. For this reason, it has been argued that this hunting, gathering, sexual division of labor is likely to be ancient. This is not to say that women never engaged in hunting or that men never gathered plant food. The argument is about how each sex is likely to have foraged habitually. As we've seen along with primates in general, chimpanzee and baboon males are particularly attentive to females who show an estrus swelling on the rump a feature that is lacking in human females. Richard Alexander and Catherine Noonan have suggested that by concealing their period of estrus, which they call cryptic estrus, women may have made men attentive to them continually, since only in this way would males be able to ensure that they father a partner's offspring. You may, however, have spotted a problem with this argument. If human females conceal estrus, why would males be attracted to them? British sociologist Christopher Babcock may have an answer to this dilemma. He suggests that rather than never appearing to be an estrus, women appear to be permanently in that state. However, if women don't even show a regular estrus swelling, then how is Babcock able to make such a claim? Interestingly, in the gelata monkey, females provide another ovulation signal. They have swollen breasts at this stage in their cycle. By all accounts, this swelling is attracted to males. Human females, in contrast to all other primates, have permanently swollen breasts during their fertile years. In this way, human females may be providing a false estrus signal and are therefore permanently sexually attracted to men. A woman who was presumably able to keep a man around who would help to provide for her and her offspring by forming a long-term sexual relationship would be at a selective advantage over one who was unable to do so. Thus, the development of estrus signals, which we might call dishonest estrus, outside of genuine estrus, may have come about via sexual selection. If this is the case, then we can think of a woman's shape as being the equivalent of a peacock's tail, evolving to suit the preferences of the opposite sex. Note that in this case, we are dealing with male choice. Males in general are not normally particularly choosy about sex, but once they begin to invest in offspring, that is, provide parental care, then they may become choosy about long-term commitments. This constant female sexual attraction may well be a unique human feature, and it may have led, in turn, to a unique long-lasting pair bond. Clearly, given as we have seen that our primate relatives do not generally engage in monogamy, with the possible exception of serial monogamy in the Hamadryas baboon, the changes that led to the formation of a long-lasting pair bond would have required a degree of psychological re-plumbing in both sexes. Like a chick that becomes imprinted on its hen, it would be necessary that these partnerships involve the desire for the couple to spend much of their time together. This pair bond that evolved might therefore be called sexual imprinting, or love. In addition to explaining the sexual division of labor, greater upper body strength in men, and dishonest estrus in women. The provisioning hypothesis may even explain the reason we fall in love. Arguments concerning pair bond formation in humans raise a question. If female apes can rear offspring without help, why should female hominids rely on male aid in rearing their children? Why do human males bother to help out when their primate relatives generally get away with doing little or nothing? One idea which was originally proposed by Stephen Jay Gould is also based around the evolution of bipedalism. 
Gould has suggested that this change to habitual bipedalism led to a narrowing of the pelvic girdle, and that this in turn meant that a large brain baby could only be passed through the pelvis at a highly immature stage. Given our lifespan, human babies should be born at 21 months rather than at nine. So human infants are delivered in a relatively immature and helpless state. This means that they require almost constant attention for a considerable period compared with any other animal. Females dealt with this problem, so the argument goes, by forming long-lasting pair bonds with male partners who are prepared to help provide for the offspring. Technically, this is called high male parental investment, or MPI. We have seen that sexual selection can lead to differences both in behavior and in physical form between the sexes, and some would argue that this is also true for our own species. We've also seen how diet may have an impact on sex differences. Frequently, this means that males of a species are bigger than females. Clearly, the difference in size between males and females is not an all or nothing phenomenon. Human males are about 20% bigger than their female counterparts. In gorillas, males are almost twice the size of females, but in gibbons, the sexes are virtually the same size. Current theory suggests that the greater the increase in male size relative to females, the greater the competition between males for access to groups of females. Species in which the largest and strongest males monopolize groups of females are said to be polygynous. Hence, Polygyny is a form of polygamy where one male has access to a number of females, but each female is normally limited to one male. The reverse situation, where one female monopolizes a number of males, is called polyandry, and it is very rare. In monogamous species, where a lasting pair bond is formed, such as in gibbons, sexual dimorphism is likely to be low, since once paired up, males are no longer in competition for further mates. Examples of mating systems are provided in this table. Mating systems vary greatly between human cultures, and you may notice that humans are represented in all of the categories in the table. Humans vary so much between cultures and their mating strategies that some social scientists have claimed that our reproductive behavior is culturally determined and hence unrelated to our evolutionary past. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.